Welcome to the Saco City Council meeting uh, here Monday, April 13th. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We are called to order at 6.32 p.m. Recognition of members present, all the council is present. Uh, we will, uh, for the time being, waive with the pledging of the allegiance. Uh, we'll move on to uh, item four, which is general matters. Are there any council members that have general matters uh, to bring forward? I see nothing, uh, nothing there. Moving on to item, uh, item five, committee correspondence to council. Are there any committee correspondence to council? Councilor Minthorn, then Councilor Johnston. Councilor Minthorn. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just wanted to let everybody know we had an email at the end of the week last week from Tony Scavuzzo, who chairs or is the executive director of transit. And uh, they are going to start cleaning buses this week and facilities this week and next and are hoping to be back up and running in an abbreviated fashion at the end of the month with some limited transit available for our residents again. Thank you, Council of Minthor. Council of Johnston. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that last Tuesday night after two plus hours of discussion, uh, the planning board did approve the conditional use permit for 12 School Street so assuming we fund it and uh, you know, things improve out there, they will be ready to go as far as uh, with construction on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Johnston. Any others? Seeing no hands raised, we will move on to uh, item six, which is public comment. Uh, City Administrator Canrath, have we received any public comment for this evening? I've received no public comment this week. No public comment. Moving on to uh, agenda item number seven, approval of minutes for March 30th and April 2nd. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. I think that was a, a motion made by Councilor Minthorn, second by Councilor Archer. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, roll call vote. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Copeland? No. Councilor Minthorn? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. And Councilor Johnson? No. Motion passes 5 2. Moving on to uh, there are no consent agenda items, so we will move past uh, item 8. Moving on to item 9 action items. Item A is the Equal Rights Act resolution. Councilor Copeland? The background is that a number of communities across the state are taking up the attached resolution to support Maine passing an ERA, uh, that's Equal Rights Amendment, that is pending before the state legislature. Legislative document 433, resolution proposing an amendment to the Constitution of Maine to explicitly prohibit discrimination based on the sex of an individual. Staff recommends approving the resolution be it resolved that the city of Saco supports the Equal Rights Act resolution, whereas at the state of Maine's founding, women were not recognized as citizens under the new constitution and were unable to vote. 
Whereas it was not until 100 years after Maine became a state that most women earned the right to vote through the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Whereas the right to vote remains women's only constitutionally protected right in Maine and nationally. Whereas all other rights that women have, that women have won, have come as a result of legislation, legal decisions, or regulation, and those rights are more easily reversed. Whereas Maine's legislature ratified the Federal Equal Rights Amendment in a bipartisan vote in 1974. Whereas there exists no language in Maine's constitution prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex. Whereas the final decision of whether to amend Maine's constitution is not in the hands of the legislator, but of the voters. Whereas an amendment passed in this session can be on the ballot on November 3rd, 2020. Be it resolved that in Maine's bicentennial year and the centennial of women's suffrage, the city of Saco calls on the Maine legislature to pass LD 433, the Maine Equal Rights Amendment, which reads simply, equality of rights under the law may not be denied or abridged by the state or any political subdivision of the state based on the sex of an individual. The legislature has the power to enforce this section by appropriate legislation. I move to approve the resolution. Second. Motion has been made by Councillor Copeland, second by Councillor Dunn. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. Uh, roll call vote. Councillor Archer? Fully support, yes. Councillor Purdy? Yes. Councillor Gunn? Yes. Councillor Copeland? Yes. Councillor Minthorn? Yes. Councillor McPhail? Yes. Councillor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. Moving on to agenda. Agenda item number 10, new business. We have a section A, a budget update. Uh, at this time, I think we're going to ask for the city finance director, Glennis Sellis, to uh, provide us with a budget update. Yes. Good evening, you, Glennis. Chair. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, the details of the budget were included in your packet. So I'll just provide a narrative update similar to how I do uh, in normal council meetings. Overall, with the second half of taxes collected, the city has reached its peak unassigned fund balance level at 37.01% of the adopted budget. This amount will come down over the next three months as expenses continue to roll in prior to next year's commitment. Expenses are touch, tracking a touch behind, 2% behind forecast, while revenues are tracking a touch ahead, 1% ahead of forecast. Net operating income overall is 10.7 million. Net favorability versus forecast is 1.3 million. And then digging into uh, some analysis on the expenses side, uh, council expenses are 39% behind forecast. Half of the lag is due to council pay, which is quarterly rather than bi-weekly. So I'm working to update our monthly allocation amounts for council pay to reflect that quarterly uh, pay cycle. The other half is slow year-to-date usage on operational lines, primarily miscellaneous expense and recognition awards. Um, and that was something that I had highlighted in our last meeting, um, since there was some interest in council on council's part in uh, making better use of those funds. Uh, human resources is 16% behind forecast. Half of the lag is due to funds appropriated for a salary study, which have not been expended just yet. Uh, the other half is related to software costs for paychecks. Paycheck software costs are currently being liquidated against the PO under IT, where the item was previously budgeted. Those software costs should be reflected in April's update. Information technology is 10% behind forecast. Again, most of the lag is related to a one-time appropriation of $30,000 for a security threat study, 
which was handled in-house instead. The $30,000 was appropriated from fund balance, not the municipal tax rate, so there's no impact to taxpayers either way. Insurance is running 25% behind forecast. Uh, the city has enjoyed savings of $50,614, thanks to a detailed analysis of insurance premiums, which more precisely allocated annual costs between the city and the school. These changes are reflected in the fiscal year 2021 budget update. Police is running 6% behind forecast. So there were a number of vehicles ordered at the start of the year. They have yet to be delivered uh, due to some delays on the manufacturing side. So the expense of outfitting those vehicles has not yet been paid. Uh, equipment purchases approved as part of amendment number seven have not been expended yet. And the NDEA position remains open, uh, reducing base pay expenditures. Public Works is running 6% behind forecast. Uh, Public Works continues to work through capital bond and general, general fund projects simultaneously with limited staffing, uh, even more so right now. So uh, a, a good portion of those funds will be encumbered so that they can be expended through the summer 2020 building season. Solicitor is $4,769 over budget. Uh, this line is now completely exhausted. Uh, we are working to reclass a portion of the overspent to TIF funds where applicable, and we'll work to build the balance of the solicitor funds for the rest of the year to the contingency account, which still has about $35,000 in it. Fire and ambulance revenues are 22% behind forecasts. Uh, again, transfers from the ambulance fund remain on hold while we negotiate with Medicare. Police revenues are 59% behind forecast, uh, and this is primarily due to the MDEA position. Uh, which is funded by grant revenue from the state. Uh, this loss in revenue is offset by lower expenditures on base pay in the police department. And finally, unallocated revenues are 17% behind forecast. This is a placeholder amount uh, for sale of city assets. I have received a report about sale of city assets from our fleet manager, and I'll be working to properly allocate those revenues over the next couple of weeks. Are there any questions about the March year-to-date budget update? Glennis, thank you very much. Councillor Copeland, you have some questions that you would uh, like to ask. Councillor Copeland, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I'm muted now. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions. And uh, so uh, let's start. We've got all kinds of little flags here. Well, one of the things is the, um, I'm seeing that there's transfers from the Camp Ellis Fund and the Bay Bayview Fund. Mm -hmm. What, why uh, is all the money from there getting transferred out? I know some of it has to go for lifeguards and so forth, but there's supposed to be some work on the, the ramps and so forth and, and it seems the money is getting taken from all that and getting put into the general fund. Yes, so in terms of transfers, the Camp Ellis, the Bayview Fund transfers about $9,000 a year. In total, Bayview typically takes in between thirty dollars and $40,000 in parking. And the $9,000 partially offsets the cost of lifeguards, uh, which are $36,000 a year between Bayview and Kenny Shores. Uh, the Camp Ellis transfer, that it covers a portion of the parking enforcement officer. The parking enforcement officer does go down to Camp Ellis and enforce park are paying hourly. That hourly parking revenue goes straight into the Camp Ellis fund. It's transferred to the job to cover the salary. And again, I believe that $400. Uh, Camp Ellis typically takes in close to $100,000 in parking revenue. So it is a small percentage of the total parking revenue that goes into Camp Ellis, uh, but that is the logic behind that transfer. Um, so you said that, um, what did you say just before this? You said that 100%, $100,000 is raised and a small percent stays in Camp Ellis or um, what did you say? Sorry, 100,000. 
a hundred thousand is raised and a small percentage is transferred to the general fund. So I believe a hundred thousand is raised a year and what's transferred to the general fund is uh, $8,200 per year. That's all? Yep. All right. Um, oh, the supported entities. Now, let's see, I don't remember what page that's on. But you, all the entities that are listed there are separate from the city. They're all 501c3s or this or that, but they're not part of the city. There are two that are listed there that are part of the city, and I don't know why they're there. Uh, specifically, Coastal Waters and Conservation Commission. They're just like all the other commissions we have, and I don't know why they're pulled out on the uh, supported entities. So what that would mean is that somebody wanted to do something. I mean, we had all these conversations about um, in the Coastal Waters Commission about a new harbor master. We haven't approved the, um, the language yet to change our ordinance, but the, um, the police, there's gonna be an actual police officer as our harbor master. And so now there has to be funding for that. And we have to see where all that is. And, and if you put coastal waters out as a supported entity, then there's not a staff resource like there has been in every year past. Like uh, the Coastal Water Commissions was under the budget and direction of uh, Public Works. And it's been decided once we pass this ordinance that the police department is going to take over because there's going to be an officer there. So why isn't that transferred from DPW over to the police department? Why is it in the supported entities where it doesn't belong at all? So any, any commission that receives an annual appropriation for administrative expenses is listed under supported entities. So HPC is here as well. If there's a commission that's not listed under the supported entities section, it doesn't receive a special allocation for administrative expenses at all. It basically operates without any kind of funding mechanism. Well, for, for all these years, it's been happening and they've just been moved this year. Um, they've been um, in the budgets of the department that was their staff uh, point person. Um, if you go back a couple of years, the Coastal Waters Commission specifically has been budgeted under supported entities um, in the amount of $1,000 for administrative expenses. I can send you those budgets if you'd like to take a look at them. Uh, mm -hmm. The one that, the only one that wasn't prior was the HPC. Um, and that one was moved to the supported entity section so that it lined up with the Economic Development Commission and the Coastal Waters Commission to be budgeted in the supported entity section. Um, but it's really just a matter of organization. There wasn't a change in terms of staff resource that was associated with this change. It was just about well, making sure that um, commissions and agencies were listed together. We do count on our staff resources to support us in these things. So then Certainly. where's the bicycle and pedestrian uh, budget? Why isn't that somewhere? I don't see that anywhere. So the bicycle, um, what happens when there's a new agency that's requesting funding is that we don't know until the final budget is approved if that supported entity will get final appropriation from council. So I don't build out individual accounts for supported entities until their first year of approval by council. However, if you look at the- We've already voted them in. We've already, um, you know, ratified the members and certainly but we haven't approved uh, a annual budget allocation so in the fiscal year 2021 budget the bicycle and pedestrian committee has received an amount of funding under the supported entities general account line which is 106 500 700 if you look in the city administrator's budget you'll see there's forty five hundred dollars total approved in 106205700 and if you look at the back of the budget book in appendix B there's a list of the approved service enhancements that details which supported entities received funding in that line um, and appendix A actually includes the funding request letters now um, assuming the council is, is generous and approves an annual 
uh, operating budget for the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Uh, what I'll do is I'll build out an individual account line within the supported entities section of the budget specifically for that commission, similar to HPC and economic development and some of the others. And thank you, Glennis. Councillor Copeland, do you have more questions? I, I believe I do, but let me just, uh, let me just look through here one second. Bear with me. questions uh, before well councillor copeland uh, finds what she was looking for any other questions from councillors some of these are questions for the department heads when they present so i just want to make sure i'm not missing anything i did have one question about the fuel on some of these like uh public works had a 40 percent increase in fuel and we had noticed last time that um several of the budgets had increased fuel but then i see parks and rec had a um you know uh, a negative amount there so i'm just curious why the disparity disparity certainly so what we did is we analyzed fuel usage for fiscal year 2019 full year and what we identified was that some departments actually had spent a lot less than what they were budgeted for and some departments had spent a lot more and it was pretty consistent with the history that some departments had more and some departments had less so we pooled the entire heating fuel budget and then reallocated it between all of the departments based on their actual usage in fiscal year 2019 so we weren't actually increasing total citywide heating fuel costs, but we were better allocating the existing fuel amount between the departments based on their usage. So Parks and Rec was a little bit lower than what they had budgeted. Uh, I believe Public Works was the same, and then City Hall had actually used more than was budgeted. So uh, we moved things around in that way. Or I'm sorry, Public Works had used less, so we gave them more, and then Parks and Rec had used less, so we took that and reallocated it. Um, if you're interested, I can send uh, the analysis that I used to reallocate heating fuel as a reference. No, it just it wasn't mentioned at all, and so it was just an obvious um, difference, you know, when one is way over and one is not. So, all right, I'm good. Just checked them all. We're good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Copeland. Glennis, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. I believe you're going to move on to the next piece. Um, I believe the next is the budget presentations and that is going to be each of the uh, department heads presenting their piece, but I will stay on and answer questions as they come up. Thank you. Glennis, have we started prepping for um, as we get ready to go through the budget process and it was we're listening to um, individual departments prepare their budget. Uh, are we starting to think about what we're going to see likely from the state as far as uh, anticipated revenues and what revenue sharing might look like uh, in this kind of environment uh, post COVID-19. Uh, I know that there's some direction coming out of the state about a 20 to 20 percent reduction, 20 to 25 percent reduction in revenue sharing. Are, are we preparing for that as we move through uh, this process and as we uh, build into the mill rate calculator? Uh, what we're going to see in, uh, in funding. So I haven't received any explicit guidance from the state. The last notification I received was just that state revenue sharing would probably be lower, but there wasn't actually a number attached. So if you've received more explicit communication, um, and if you could forward that to me, whatever source you had for that, that would be great. Um, it is, uh, at this point, it's the city council's budget. So it's the city council's choice, uh, how conservatively, uh, you would like to budget the state revenue sharing, we can certainly amend the existing amount down. I didn't have anything to recommend though because I hadn't received anything really literal from the state other than probably lower. So that's where Thank I'm you. at with that. Yep. Mr. Mayor. City Administrator Canrath. 
Yeah, ju just for everyone's knowledge, um, I did receive a letter from the state treasurer's office just uh, telling us basically that um, they anticipate, you know, a hit to revenue sharing, but there were no specific numbers given. But uh, I think the timeline was they wouldn't really know more until uh, sometime in the summer, uh, just how significant it would be, but we should anticipate um, maybe some decrease in the state revenue sharing fee. So that was the only communication we received uh, from the state officially. Thank you. All right, last call for questions uh, for Glennis before we uh, move into department budget presentations, which the first one is communications. Any last minute questions? Uh, seeing no questions, moving on to department budget presentations, item B. First up is communications. I'd like to welcome communications director, Emily Roy. Good evening, Emily, how's welcome. everybody doing? All right. Very well, how are you? Can you yes. hear me? Okay. Um, so let me start sharing my screen, just one moment. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the communications department budget for fiscal year 2021. You may notice that the communications department is a little different from the other departments in the budget book, whereas this is our inaugural year as a department. With the addition of Andrew on our team of two, I'm very proud of the work we've produced. Our community members have found tremendous value in having staff dedicated to communications here in Saco. We've assisted many other communities, establishing best practices, and sharing what we've learned to ensure municipalities in Maine are mindful of the importance of fostering community engagement during local government decision making. With the uncertainty and fluid nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, a focus on communications has become more important than ever. Before we share some of the highlights from fiscal year 2020, I think it's important to touch on a few foundational points. So communications was removed from administration, including the money allocated for operations and salaries last year. During the budget process last year, the City Council authorized the use of the cable franchise revenue to fund department operations for the communications specific functions. The budget for this year was prepared using the same approach of offsetting our department expenditures with that same cable franchise revenue. The mission of the communications department is to gather and share information to support and encourage an open participatory government and inform community. This department is responsible for providing effective communication with the community to increase the understanding of and support for city programs, policies, and projects, and to develop positive media relations that provide balanced coverage of city issues. To accomplish this mission, the team manages media and external communications, publishes the city's newsletter, and creates and posts content for the website and city social media pages. Additionally, to promote SACO, I've had the privilege to be a guest on a podcast, host a training session with Biddeford Saco Chamber of Commerce, and read to children at the Saco Scoop. And Andrew has been able to join the Saco schools for their career day and create amazing recruiting videos to help showcase municipal career opportunities. For the purposes of this presentation, I've broken our department services into four categories, digital, social, website, and outreach. In the digital realm, Andrew has filmed and produced 22 videos and has taken over 25,000 photos. These materials vary in demonstrating municipal day-to-day -day operations, showcasing individual team members, supporting the Water Resource Recovery Department's EPA case study, and a video capturing some of the tremendous community support that has taken place during the pandemic and up upending of our daily lives. Under social, our newly launched YouTube channel has over 5,000 views and we just reached 100 organic subscribers, which we're really excited about. For the City of Saco government Facebook page, we've reached just below 1 million total daily impressions. This metric is not as widely known as the number of page likes or followers, but this is the number of times any content from our page has entered a person's screen. This includes posts, stories, etc. In addition to Facebook, we manage Twitter, Instagram, and have a newly launched LinkedIn for the city. We've taken a more active role assisting the police department with management of their social media pages, 
and I found partnering with the employees in their department to be tremendously beneficial in producing meaningful content. Under website, we launched our refreshed website late last year, Enhanced Navigation. We continue to work with departments to ensure the content on their pages is up to date and helpful. Websites are an ever changing work in progress. One piece of software we use tracks our website's performance and content for a variety of metrics. We have a 98.3% quality assurance rating and a 99.9% .9 accessibility rating. Quality assurance means the credibility and usability of the user-facing aspects of our website. It examines the website to try and unco uncover any flaws that might have been overlooked during design and development. And the accessibility rating measures our conformance with standards established in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines for levels A, AA, and AAA, and uses industry benchmarks for comparison. For the outreach category, we measured the Pepperell Post monthly newsletter. We have almost 3,000 subscribers with an open rate of 49% and a click rate of 32%, compared to industry averages, averages of 21% and 8% respectively. You can sign up to receive the Pepperell Post and our parking van notifications on our website at socomain.org slash stay-connected.php. I must also stress the value of our media partnerships. While a lot of this presentation has already been focused on the digital side of our operations, we work closely with Tammy at The Courier, Gillian at The Press Herald, and Liz of Saco Bay News to make sure community members stay informed. Additionally, we work with Main Biz and channels 6, 8, and 13 for various news stories. We're looking to utilize most of the funds in our printing budget, as I'll discuss in a little while, to start producing a quarterly printed newsletter to be distributed at local establishments to help reach our community members who are not using email or the website. And we've submitted a contract to Charter Communications as part of our cable franchise renewal. And we hope to hear back soon so we can replace the playback device and manage Saco TV, formerly known as TA TV. Andrew will be taking on the role of channel manager programming content on the channel. Additionally, he'll be working with the Saco Schools and Thornton Academy to make sure we have student content included on our shared channel. Thornton Academy has submitted a request for funding this year that was reduced from last year's request to be able to create that content. While they won't be managing the channel, they will still need equipment to help support the student-graded content. With the conservative projections for revenue, there is enough from the cable franchise fees to fund this request if the council decides to do so. I think it's important to focus on some of the positive ways our community members have come together during this crisis and how Andrew has been able to capture some of those moments. From age-friendly Saco and the Saco Food Pantry partnering to help those in need, police officers delivering meals to our elderly community members, local businesses donating hundreds of meals, and elected officials volunteering with our Parks and Recreation Department to serve meals as part of their Friday meal program. And the opportunity to create beautiful videos capturing the essence of community resiliency during crisis, truly representing our friendly by nature tagline. We've had the privilege to work collaboratively with Chief Duras and Chief Clements and the members of the Saco Fire and Police Departments to ensure we're communicating important information with our community members. We've been able to support the creative ideas of our friends at the public safety departments who have had to stay engaged with community members while practicing social distancing. We've worked closely with administration, planning and economic development and other city departments to ensure we've gathered resources available to our community members. We have a public health page, a community resources page, and a businesses resource, business resources page on our website. Our Parks and Recreation Department has launched a COVID-19 resource hotline available Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. if any community members have questions or need any resources. And lastly, before getting into the numbers, I must share how honored I am to be part of this community and I know Andrew feels the same way. We're thankful for the opportunity to support our community members in need, share some of the amazing stories unfolding, and help communicate helpful information about the continuity of essential city services. Connecting people and mobilizing resources is vital and is inspiring to see how resilient and strong Sago is. 
Now for the communications budget. Our proposed budget for FY21 is $177,820, which includes salaries. The cable franchise revenue is conservatively set at $282,388. This revenue is from the cable franchise fees, which fully fund department operations. In the pie chart, you can see that wages are the largest portion of the budget, which is common across all departments. After wages, the largest expenses incurred are for printing, software, equipment, training, and maintenance. To break this down a little bit further, we utilize three different software programs to manage our website, three for design and video production, and one for our email newsletters and parking ban notifications. Which brings me to the one service enhancement request we proposed in the FY21 budget. When we developed this budget in January, we identified the one software we didn't use in FY20 that would be helpful now is Archive Social. Archive Social automatically maintains records of our social media posts since social media is creating public records. Using this software helps us comply with the Maine Freedom of Access Act and be able to generate reliable public records. If we were to use screenshots instead of archiving solution, there would be no metadata. Additionally, since some of our posts reach thousands of people, it would be difficult for a person to capture every record. Several municipalities in Maine have started to utilize Archive Social. Rockport, Wyndham, Bath, Augusta, and Skowhegan, to name a few. I can also share different case studies if that would be helpful for you all. It gives us confidence that we're following state record laws and can easily respond to record requests. Without it, we are losing records daily through deleted and edited content. As engagement on our social media increases, it gives us insurance in case of unexpected events. Archive Social costs $2,800 for the year, and we recommend using cable franchise fees to cover the cost of the software, so we would not require use of general fund expenditures. So thank you all for listening to the budget presentation, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Director Roy. Are there any questions? I see Councilor Copeland has her hand up. Councilor Copeland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Director Roy, great job on your presentation and all the work that you guys do. You really are um, getting communication out there and transparency. Um, I do have a question about that um, archive social. Sure. Um, is that I mean, I, I get that people are saying they need to do it, but is it, are we required by law to do that or we're just over policing ourselves at the cost of $2,800? I'm just wondering why. Sure. So, um, social media is subject to records requests. So, while I hope that we don't receive one, um, <laughs> it is possible that we would. And so, speaking with, um, with, the city solicitor, he had recommended that we do have a good procedure in place for maintaining those records. Okay, and then additionally, that's all I needed to hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Director Roy? Councilor McPhail. Not a question as much as a comment. And I just personally want to thank Emily and Andrew. Um, for everything that they've done. Um, they've been instrumental in getting communication out. Um, I had the opportunity to read with Emily at the scoop. We had a blast that day. And during the pandemic, um, the information that they've gotten out has been vital in helping us get set up with our Zoom meetings. Couldn't have done it without you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilor Minthorn. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to thank Emily and Andrew as well. Um, it's nice to see one of the things we had talked about four years ago when we arrived at council was having uh, a much better communications department with the community, uh, have a more actively engaged um, television system like we saw a lot of us live through in the uh, late 2000s uh, when TATV was a, a great community resource for all our citizens. And it's waned greatly since then and uh, with the city using these funds and taking it back, I think we're going to go a long way to reestablishing that with the community and uh, 
I just want to say kudos to Emily because not only has she been doing all this and raising a family, but she also earned her MBA. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing no questions or comments. Uh, Director Roy, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Next up, we bring up uh, Fire and EMS. Now look to speak with uh, Chief Duros. Chief? Chief Duros, welcome. Good evening, thank you. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. Did it work? Your screen is up there. Wonderful, thank you. You're very welcome. Interesting times we're in. <laughs> Right. Um, good evening, Mayor Doyle, members of the Sarkel City Council. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present the Sarkel Fire Department budget for the fiscal year 2021. Like all the other city departments, this budget was prepared prior to the pandemic emergency caused by the outbreak of the coronavirus or COVID-19. I hope that you will give this budget consideration, believing as I do, that this too will pass and we will come out a stronger, better community on the other side. With your approval, Mayor, I'm prepared to take a few short minutes tonight to update you and the City Council on Sarko's response to the pandemic emergency. Chief Duras, we would love to hear uh, an update uh, from your office. Right. So the COVID-19 pandemic was a topic of discussion amongst department heads with the city administrator in late February. And as you will recall, we all received an email from the city administrator on March 2nd, outlining the steps that the city departments were taking to keep our workforce and our citizens safe. Our focus was on being informed, but not alarmed, and to keep the information flowing. Through our facilities manager, Don Roth, we be began securing the necessary supplies for cleaning and disinfecting workstations, as well as hand washing. Our public health officer and code slash code enforcement officer, Dick Lambert, spent many hours messaging employees and posting the best practices. And our IT director, Ryan Panaro, started gearing up for the IT needs of having employees work from home. All department heads were developing their individual plans for essential employees and the work from home option days before the governor announced her first stay healthy at home order. All departments continue to work hard, implement changes in work schedules such as shift differentials in our public works and wastewater departments and alternative work schedules for departments located at City Hall. All of this is being done to create and encourage social distancing, and most importantly, keep our employees safe and healthy. First responders have seen a major impact in the way that we conduct business as a result of this pandemic. Starting with our 911 dispatches, who are now on their third change to how 911 calls are processed. This change revolves around how they screen calls for COVID-19, essentially meaning determining if they are symptomatic. This information is necessary and key to preventing any responder, police or fire EMS from becoming exposed. Police officers are now equipped with N95 masks and the police chief has also acquired some face shields and protective suits to help prevent the officers from becoming exposed. There have been major changes to how we deliver fire and EMS services, and I want you to know that I'm extremely proud of the members of the Sarko Fire Department and how they have risen to the task of responding to incidents where persons are symptomatic for or that have been diagnosed with COVID-19, all the time knowing that they are putting themselves at risk for contracting the virus 
and potentially taking it home and sharing with their families. At every level of our organization, they have accepted their role with professionalism and pride that defines the fire department, and for that, I am truly grateful. To keep our firefighters and EMS providers safe and healthy, as well as ensure our ability to respond, we have divided each shift up and relocated half of them to the two substations, Camp Ellis and North Sarko. The risk of our exposure, the risk of exposure to our people and the risk of contamination in the fire station, which would essentially close that station for a period until it could be properly cleaned and disinfected necessitated this relocation. With the support and cooperation of the Firefighters Union and the Call Division Firefighters, we have located an engine and an ambulance in each of the Camp Ellis and North Sarko stations. There are drawbacks to this arrangement. Our ability to assemble a full crew at an incident will be delayed, and neither station meets the safety standards for full-time occupation. But under these circumstances, it really is the best option. We've been told to expect the peak patient surge to come in about 10 to 14 days in Southern Maine. From there, and until testing is readily available and a vaccination and medical treatment plan is in place, we should expect to see, in, expect to continue to see patients with signs and symptoms of COVID-19 for an extended period. Going forward, we are registered with FEMA to apply for reimbursement as part of the federal declaration for 75% of the costs incurred as part of the emergency procedures. We will continue to work with all city departments to send out timely communications through our communications department, but working together, we will all get through this. If you feel it's necessary, I'm happy to provide more detail and additional updates as things change. And unless there are any questions, I'll get back to my budget presentation. Okay. Mr. Mayor, you're muted. Thank you, Chief Duras, for that presentation. Are there any questions for, from counselors? Uh, seeing no questions from counselors, uh, thank you, and, and please continue with your budget presentation. Thank you. So our mission statement, our department, through our highly trained and dedicated employees, strive to deliver the highest quality fire protection and emergency medical services in the most cost-effective cost manner for a quality fire prevention, suppression, and emergency medical services delivery with the utmost regard for the safety of our citizens, visitors, and employees. Our core values are what we live by and what defines us. While we've been challenged over the last two months, I'm proud to say again that our firefighters and EMS providers have risen to that challenge. As a quick recap to our fiscal year 20 RADS, um, for us, the last nine months have been very busy very busy, but also very successful for us. We have recently completed the design review and finalized the order of our new ambulance, which will replace an Ambulance 3, a 2013 Chevrolet. We are nearing the completion of probationary training of three new employees, which has allowed us to make operational changes and responses that have increased our effectiveness and provide for safer operations. With completion of this training, this will provide us with a total of three new paramedics and three new advanced EMTs. Also, we have outfitted two ambulances with patient loading systems for safety and approved operator efficiencies. And last month, we presented to you the 30% schematic design of a satellite public safety facility, a project that, which we are in hopes we, we can get back to later this summer. I'd like to point you back to the 2018 organizational assessment of the Sarko Fire Department that was connect, conducted by municipal resources and accepted by the city council in March of 2018. We use this as the roadmap for our organizational change. A link to this report can be found on the fire department's page of the city's website. The report is still relevant. 
but we are finding the need to make some modifications to the recommendations to keep them current and to coincide with where the city and the department are currently at. We have five essential fire department programs. Our programs have been our focus areas that were established over 15 years ago. The data that we get from our records management system help us prepare for growth. It is instrumental in guiding us in the budget process. First is fire suppression. Last year, we responded to a total of 3,670 incidents, including 81 major fire incidents. That represents a 30%, 31% increase in total call volume when you compare it to 10 years ago. We responded to 2,807 emergency medical calls, an increase of 557 calls per year, um, again, compared to data from 2009. In training, along with our three new paramedics and three new advanced EMTs, we have new, one new firefighter too, and we continue our in-house continuing education credits for our EMS licensing and fire service training. In fire prevention, the fire safety inspections conducted by the on-duty crews are also used by the business licenses that are issued by the city clerk. We participate in new construction review with the planning department. Plans review in conjunction with the state fire marshal's office for life safety and sprinklers and inspections with the code enforcement office. Our public fire safety education programs in schools and in businesses, our annual open house, national night out, all continue to be major focus in the functions of the on-duty crews. In emergency management with assistance from the Department of Public Works, we completed the final closeout of the federal disaster declarations for the October 2017 rain and windstorm and the March 2018 ocean storm. In our fiscal 2021 budget, in preparing that budget, the maintenance of effort budget request for fiscal year 21, those increases were limited to COLA, and negotiated union contract increases. The budget book shows an increase to utilities. That is the main water increase for water for public fire protection. And we certainly appreciate the city, administ uh, the city administrator for carrying our service enhancements forward into his budget. We do have three service enhancements. Our first service, service enhancement is staffing. This request is supported in the 2018 Organizational Assessment of the Soccer Fire Department. We continue to strive towards a staffing level that ensures the appropriate response to the increase in call volume and provides for a high level of responder safety and efficiencies. The request includes wages, benefits, as well as the one-time onboarding costs for protective personal protective equipment and uniforms. Our second service enhancement is a video laryngoscopes for the ambulances. They're used to view the upper airway when inserting a breathing tube. This equipment will increase the first attempt success rate for our paramedics. The use of the video makes it easier to identify airway landmarks and visualize the breathing tube entering the airway and allows another provider to watch for a second verification. Makes it easier to manage a difficult airway. Patients with large necks are, or unusual anatomy are generally harder to intubate. When blood or body fluid is in the mouth, nose, or the upper airway, they make it more difficult to visualize the airway structures as when using the traditional direct visualization. And they reduce trauma to the patient. They require less physical manipulation of the patient, and they reduce trauma to the soft tissue and the airway structures. Our third service enhancement is automatic chest compression systems. 
is a use to deliver continuous high quality CPR without interruption and increase the likelihood of survivability. They are part of the main EMS cardiac arrest protocol where most out of hospital cardiac arrest events require at least 20 minutes of CPR. In some patients, that time increases to 60 minutes or more. The protocol recommends rotating compressors every two minutes to maintain high quality CPR. Providing chest compressions is physically exhausting and most providers are no longer effective after performing three rotations. These automatic chest compression systems require fewer human resources to manage a prolonged cardiac arrest event, which frees up paramedic providers to focus on airway management, medication administration, and electrical therapy. Many post-cardiac arrest patients re-arrest in the ambulance while en route to the hospital, so manual CPR is required, and manual CPR in a moving ambulance is not effective. It requires providers to, to unbelt their seatbelt to perform CPR, which creates an unsafe working environment. Both the video laryngoscopes and automatic chest compression systems um, are service enhancements, but it's also a transfer from ambulance revenue. We also have a capital purchase in the lease line to replace Engine 8. Engine 8 is a 1999 HME Ferrara Class A pumper that was originally housed and responded from Central Fire Station. It was moved to the North Saco station in 2006 when engine three was purchased. The engine hours, including all hours used as a pumper at incidents, is over 5,400 hours. The road mileage equivalent to 5,400 hours is in excess of 130,000 miles. We currently experience increased maintenance cost as well as finding uh, parts difficult to come by. This request includes replacement of equipment carried on the apparatus as outlined in the 2018 organizational assessment of the Saco Fire Department to include fire hose, nozzles, self-contained breathing apparatus, and tools and equipment that is at least 20 years old, which is beyond the recommended, recommended lifespan as determined by the National Fire Protection Association. Are there questions? Chief Duras, thank you for your presentation and thank you for everything you and uh, all your staff are doing. Uh, and I just want to remind counselors and remind the, the public that this is uh, National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week from April 12th to April 18th. Uh, we couldn't do uh, what we do without them. So uh, thanks to them and thanks to you and your department, John. Uh, with that, are there any questions from counselors on the budget presentation, the COVID-19 response, or general comments for Chief Duras? Seeing no questions, no comments. Chief, thank you again for uh, a good presentation and uh, have a good evening and stay safe. Thank you. We are now going to hear from Director Lambert from Code Enforcement, who is being promoted uh, into the um, panel now. Director Lambert. Good evening. Greetings, Director Lambert. Thank you for joining us. Let's see if I can uh, get this screen up for us. Oh. Hold on a second. I have to hit the share screen button. There you go. We are seeing your shared screen, Director okay. Lambert. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. From the beginning. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good evening and thank you for uh, this opportunity to present my budget to the uh, full council. This is the first time I've ever had to do it this way and I'm sure everybody's 
having a first uh, experience in the way we operate. Uh, it's quite a change. And I want to thank John Duros for uh, stepping up and really uh, putting the city's best uh, foot forward, leading the uh, charge on the coronavirus uh, outbreak. Uh, he's been invaluable in keeping the uh, staff and everybody up to date. And uh, out, along with Emily Roy and her crew, getting that information out to folks. Um, what you see on the screen is uh, my crew. You probably see a couple of new faces there that you've not seen before. Uh, the gentleman behind me is Will Rankin. You're probably familiar with Will. Uh, he was the deputy city clerk and general uh, assistance administrator. And uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, Karen Audie decided that she'd like to uh, enjoy more time with her husband. She retired. And we were fortunate to pick up Will Rankin as our new uh, operations person uh, to take over for Karen. He's been doing a wonderful job uh, stepping up to the task. The uh, lady uh, just to the left of me is Irish Griffith. She is our uh, multifamily housing inspector, and she's been with us for just a little over a year. She originally started with us uh, as a shared position. Uh, in the town of Orchard Beach. Oops. Okay, oh, I didn't know the numbers would come up right away. Uh, the mission statement of the uh, Code Enforcement Department is to ensure that the, uh, ensure the public safety through proper construction oversight and through the fair and effective zoning and property management uh, maintenance compliance and enforcement efforts. Um, our department is responsible for proper administration of all the local land use regulations, uh, such as zoning, shoreland zoning, floodplain management, uh, and all construction codes, including uh, commercial building, commercial uh, residential building, uh, state plumbing codes, National Electric Codes, and soon we're going to be uh, required to start uh, enforcing on a statewide level and on a local level uh, the uh, International Mechanical Code, uh, which was adopted by the state of Maine just recently. We investigate uh, possible code violations as they may occur in rental housing and administer various other city regulations including health, solid waste, and property maintenance. Um, you probably know that uh, when the city council passed the plastic bag ban uh, and the uh, styrofoam regulations, uh, we went out and started uh, not necessarily enforcing, but at least making people aware of the regulations and uh, giving them resources to help them comply with the regulations. Um, our department is divided into four program areas, inspections, enforcement, compliant, uh, complaint resolution, and plan review. And these are some of the numbers uh, for the past year. Uh, we've completed so far after our launch of the multifamily a housing program, 124 dwelling units that have been inspected. Uh, we've done slightly over 1,400 on-site inspections of new construction, uh, 1,444 construction permits uh, were issued this past uh, year. And as a kind of an aside, I did some research and looked at the uh, figures between 2009 and 2015, our department averaged about a thousand construction permits in a year. So that's almost fully um, a one third additional construction permits that we've been issuing uh, per year. This past year, uh, our construction uh, industry expended 
in excess of $65 million on new construction in the city of Saco, which is an all-time high. Uh, we've never seen that much construction spending, uh, and that is reflected in our permit fees as well. On a complaint resolution, uh, we received 102 documented complaints, and we, res uh, we also responded and had 161 uh, different interactions uh, to uh, resolve those complaints. Move my thing here so I can see the rest of it. Uh, we have six staff to handle the department operations, actually five and a half. Uh, the folks that are on the photograph, uh, you'll see up to the far right is Marcel DeRocher. He's our longtime electrical inspector, very knowledgeable person, very good resource to have, but he works 25 hours a week uh, and uh, we utilize him very uh, to his maximum of 25 hours a week uh, in uh, getting all of our electrical inspections done. He also works with the Public Works Department to maintain um, traffic signals and he heads up a lot of our, pro our um, uh, projects uh, that are of a smaller scale that we don't want to go out and to bid, uh, such as uh, emergency generator swap overs and, and certain equipment swap overs. We just did a relighting program uh, in several of our buildings, including City Hall, went to LED lighting and he and uh, the electrician from the Public Works Department headed that program up and it saves the city quite a bit of money uh, when we do it that way, rather than go out to bid. Uh, on plan reviews, you see 347. Breaking that down, we do plan reviews, uh, not just on new construction, uh, but when the planning department receives applications for site plan approvals, for conditional use permits, and for subdivision approval, they pass those over to us to review for zoning compliance. And we did uh, 48 of those last year. We did 104 commercial plan reviews and about 195 residential plan reviews. For the budget, and this is not unusual uh, to see this, but the base pay represents the lion's share of the budget in our department, over 92%. All the other stuff is very small compared to the, uh, to the base pay operation, uh, including travel and training, fees, uh, utilities, supplies, equipment, and uh, miscellaneous. What we propose to do this year um, in the housing inspector's position is we plan on uh, co uh, coordinating with the planning department. There's been a need to do more thorough enforcement on conditional use permits, contract zones, all of the conditions of approval that the planning board put on these uh, approvals need some more in-depth uh, attention. And as we've noticed, uh, as I've noticed, uh, the multifamily program is going well, uh, but there are some downtimes that we could uh, fill with that position. So we're going to redefine that position a little bit, but it's not going to be adding any headcount and it's not going to be adding anything to the budget. We propose to keep a level funding on that position. So it's just a matter of redefining uh, that one position. Uh, we only have three service enhancement agreement, uh, service enhancement requests this um, year. Uh, we're asking for $400 additional for training. Uh, again, this this uh, presentation was done before the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, and since then, uh, there has been at least two major seminars that we attend normally that have been canceled. So not sure where this is going.
going. Uh, this is based on a full year's training uh, on all the training that we normally attend. Uh, but uh, we did request $400 uh, and it also helps us to um, train up new, new employees uh, so that they're right on the leading edge. The photograph uh, on that slide is, uh, I was uh, fortunate to be asked to return to my old uh, alma mater over at the Regional Center of Technology in Biddeford to speak to the junior class of uh, construction uh, students. Uh, that's where I went to school and it was kind of nice after uh, almost, four, well, over 40 years of leaving that place to go back and see that there are still young uh, men and women that are interested in the, the trades. So we also do outreach as much as possible. Uh, we do uh, seminars for contractors to bring them up to speed on changes in the uh, codes. And we'll be hosting another one of those fairly shortly uh, with the electricians because there is a new electrical code that will be in place fairly shortly. Uh, the second service enhancement agreement, we, uh, service enhancement request we put in was for dues and membership. Uh, we find it very beneficial to belong to many of these organizations. The International Code Council is the uh, group that actually uh, writes the codes that we use for construction. The IAEA is the, the Electrical Inspectors Association. And we have two folks that belong to that um, to uh, keep up to date on all of the changes in the electrical field. The MBOIA is the Main Building Officials and Inspectors Association. And all of the inspectors belong to that group. Uh, and it's very uh, beneficial to have all of the up-to-date information from that group. Uh, they're very active in the uh, legislature and in the um, uh, building code, the state building code committee. Uh, and so they keep us up to date on what goes on at that level. The last one is for furniture and fixtures. Uh, we are, we're just asking for $500 and that would be to replace one of the older desks uh, that one of the inspectors had um, that uh, is getting a little creaky. Uh, I just changed my desk last year after using the same desk that I came to work with in 1985, the city of Saco. So uh, we make good use of the furniture. Uh, we don't abuse it, but uh, it, it is time to replace some of it. And that's the, other, the last service enhancement request that we asked for. All told, uh, our Total service enhancement uh, requests uh, total up to just under $2,000 out of a $300,000 budget. Oh, I'm sorry, there's another one, <laughs> telephone. Uh, what we're doing, what we're experiencing lately is a lot of calls from folks that are out of state, whether they be homeowners, second homeowners, developers, uh, realtors, uh, that are interested in doing projects in Saco or owning real estate in Saco. And as busy as we are, a lot of times we're just not there to receive the phone calls uh, when they call. And there's a pretty uh, significant uh, increase in toll calls that we've noticed over the past year or two. Uh, and we just don't have enough money in the telephone budget to uh, cover some of the costs. In addition, we've got an additional uh, inspector uh, who uses her cell phone and there's a cell phone reimbursement program that we need to put her on as well. So uh, that is what makes up that service enhancement request. And that's, that's it for my presentation. Are there any questions? Director Lambert, thank you for your presentation. Uh, are there any council questions for Director Lambert? 
Seeing no council questions or, or comments, Director Lambert, thank you very much. Thank again, you very for your much. time tonight and presentation. Appreciate it. Council, with that, we will be moving on to the city clerk's office. And I believe we will have uh, city clerk Michelle Hughes uh, be promoted into the panel here momentarily. Good evening, Mayor Doyle and Councillors. Greetings, Michelle. Thank you for joining us tonight. Give me just a moment and I will share my screen. Your screen is up. Okay. So thank you provi for providing me an opportunity to present the city clerk uh, the department 2021 budget this evening. The clerk's department covers four focus areas, uh, which are elections, licensing, permanent records, and general assistance. Um, I've listed a little bit of what we do under each category, and I'll start with the elections. Um, we had a very busy fall and uh, winter. We had petitions coming through and the office certified 5,732 signatures. Um, we also uh, received 2,762 voter registration cards, which could range from new voters to voters who move within the community or voters who move out of the community. We've conducted absentee voting at nine assisted living, nursing and level four residential care facilities, uh, which the majority of them are down in the uh, downtown area, but we do have a couple um, heading up towards North Saco. During the November 2019 election, we had uh, a total of 3,287 voters who participated, and 929 of those were uh, by absentee ballot. And then for the March 2020 election, uh, we had 5,644 um, voters who participated with 1,084 uh, being absentee ballots. Some of the other functions that I didn't list that fall under the election category are that we schedule and train roughly 45 election workers to run the polls on election day. We're also required to test all of our machines to make sure they'll be up and running for election day and that they acknowledge all the, um, all the votes, including the write-in votes. And we coordinate with the Public Works uh, Police Department and Parks and Recreation Department on pre-election day planning. Under the licensing section, uh, we, we license roughly 608 businesses, uh, process 948 online dog licenses. Uh, liquor licenses and special entertainment permits are 32. We have 109 Morins, which does include uh, the Morin wait list as well. Uh, we processed 10 poll permits. And um, I listed 10 victuallers because that's what we did after July 1st. Um, what's gonna be happening is in the near future, the victual license will be going out and we usually do about 110 of those. Some of the other licenses um, that we also um, administer uh, are the solid waste, the medical marijuana distributors, taxi cabs and tag days. Moving on to the permanent records, um, we've done 28 sets of council minutes. We've processed 19 Freedom of Access Act requests, as well as um, 451 birth, death, and marriage records we've recorded. And we've issued a combined vital record certificates of 1,519. 
under the general assistance department, um, we processed 229 applications. And in addition to processing the applications, we also refer applicants uh, to other resources to help stabilize their household. Um, we work with outside agencies to strategize, such as um, the Food Pantry, Seeds of Hope, and Habitat for Humanity weatherization program. At Christmas time, we have families in the community who like to adopt um, a general assistance family. They provide everything from um, a Christmas dinner to presents for the children, uh, presents for the adults, as well as um, oil assistance. And everything is kept confidential on that. Um, the, uh, the people in, that do in the adopt them, they don't know anything about um, where the family lives or who the family members are. So moving on, the general uh, city clerk budget covers the city clerk's office, the voter registration office, as well as the general assistance. We have um, a full-time equivalent of three employees. And I'm happy to announce that we've hired a deputy city clerk. Um, she comes to us with um, prior town clerk experience in a neighboring community. Uh, she's worked several years also for the Bureau of Motor Vehicle. And um, very excited to have her come on board. She's got a lot of customer service experience and that's exactly what we're looking for. So April 27th will be her first day. We've also hired um, a new general assistance administrator. And she also comes to us um, with a lot of general assistance experience. Um, she has administrative and legal experience as well. And some of you may know her. Her name is Glenn Ellen Roth. Today was her first day. She hit the ground running and I think that she will be a wonderful fit for the office. Um, so excited to announce that. The budget that I, we have is basically a maintenance of effort budget. I did have a couple service requests and those were approved by the city administrator. And as you can see, the majority of our budget is uh, base pay. Another large section of the budget is the general assistance uh, program, uh, which takes up 34%. And then the other stuff is just fees, uh, training, contracts, and supplies. The two service for enhancement requests that I presented were both for the upcoming presidential election in November. Um, what I plan on doing on that is to set up the auditorium like we normally do, have uh, six uh, people in the back processing absentee ballots, as well as four down front who are receiving the ballots back from the people who just voted, as well as the people who are bringing them in um, because uh, they may have received them by mail or they may have taken them home to, to vote the ballots. Um, so I have some money in my budget, but I did need a, a little bump up on that um, to be able to do this. In addition, what I plan on doing is on the Friday, October 30th, and Saturday, October 31st, I plan on processing absentee ballots early. Um, this will eliminate them having to go to the polls and be processed on election day when the uh, workers are already out straight, um, you know, handing ballots out and checking names of the voters that go to the polls and stuff. The other um, service enhancement request is for ballots. As you are probably aware, there was a lot of communities in this March election who ran out of ballots. And yes, Saka was one of them. We were short roughly um, about 42 ballots. So we had to print some and hand count them. Um, I don't want to hand count in November, so I'd like to be able to <laughs> make sure that I have enough ballots um, for every registered voter. 
And right now we have roughly 15,500 registered voters. And I expect that we'll probably get up to about 16,000. And this figure is based on 16,000. Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Councillor Copeland has had her hand up. Councillor Copeland, you have a question? First, just want to say thank you for all you do and make our elections uh, work so smoothly. Um, it's genuinely appreciated. I had a, my question was about the general assistance. Um, I'd like to get a breakdown of uh, by age, by family size, and by gender on, uh, you know, what are, who in our community is uh, in need. So you're looking for for age, family size, and gender? Yes. Okay, so you're just looking for statistics then? Yes, not now. I mean, when you can. Okay. I think it, it might inform some decisions. I don't know until we see it. Okay, I can do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Copeland. Any other questions for City Clerk Michelle Hughes? Any other questions, comments? No questions, no comments. Michelle, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Council up next, we will hear from Tax Assessor Nick, Nick Disjardins. Nick is being promoted. Uh, to a panelist here momentarily. Good evening, Nick, welcome. Uh, all right, got <laughs> good evening. Good evening, council, good evening, mayor. going here I don't see um, a presentation online is there one I don't I don't know for sure I, I have mine here I'm gonna get it up here um, is it I didn't check online to see if, if it was there okay all the other departments have them there and uh, I think the for transparency, our citizenry should be able to see it as well. So communications yeah. director Roy uh, just posted in the chat, they've not received the finalized version oh. yet. And once the finalized version is received, it'll, it'll be put up. You guys see that? We cannot see your screen yet, Nick. At the bottom center, there should be a share screen. There we go. Okay. We can we can see your screen now, Nick. <laughs> We're good. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, letting me present the assessing department budget for FY 2021. So as assessors, our mission is to assess the city of Saco fairly and equitably while providing excellence in public service by identifying and, and uniformly assessing property within the city of Saco in conformance with state laws using accepted mass appraisal principles. To create and maintain accurate parcel maps used to provide the public with high quality products and services created in a supportive work environment 
encouraging cooperation, honesty, integrity, and respect. Some of our department responsibilities are real estate valuations. As you know, we put a value on every single separate parcel in the city. We also do personal property valuations. So businesses declare their equipment uh, that they use. We depreciate them at, using depreciation schedules. Um, and we come up with valuations for the business equipment. Uh, parcel mapping, we also have tax maps, which we use for, uh, to show all the different parcels um, that are that the individual parcels that Saco has. Uh, each property has a property record card identifying accurate owner's data, as well as land and building data for each individual property. Our main mission is really to maintain equity amongst all properties in the city. So what we want, what we try to, what we strive for is just having equity and assessments for all properties in the city so that when the, the when uh, an individual receives their tax bill, that they know that it's fair and equitable with all other properties. Be because we share our responsibilities with Biddeford, uh, myself, the tax assessor, and also the personal property field lister uh, spends, shares their time with, with Biddeford. Uh, we have a deputy tax assessor that is here full-time and also administrative listing assistant that is here full-time. Nick, could I ask you to go to the left-hand corner and, and put on your slideshow from current yeah. slide uh, so that all the counselors can see uh, the detail in, in, the, in the presentation you've put together. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry to interrupt, Nick. It's okay. No, you're fine. So some of our major accomplishments um, we, we really want to do a lot of succession planning. Um, we have hired one full-time employee who's the administrative listing assistant. And now that individual has received their assessor certification, actually did it within like a six month period, which is really unheard of. Um, so we also have one, the shared employee, which is the personal property field lister with Biddeford is also fully trained to go out and list properties. We're also working on streamlining our data to create more efficiency. Um, we have now put um, our personal property filing where the business owner can go online onto our website and pull up um, spreadsheets where they can actually plug in their personal property uh, equipment and you know, look to see, we also have the depreciation schedules on there online so that they can really see what they're, they're looking at for their assessments. We also are, uh, taking our, our mobile computers and bring them out into the field uh, with a MiFi connection. This really allows us to analyze neighborhoods, um, analyze if there's any inconsistencies in neighborhoods. Um, so it really makes our job more efficient when we're out in the field. We, we really use our time wisely out in the field by being able to just log into our vision database and, and really analyze neighborhoods. We've also increased our enhanced communication and transparency with our finance director and economic and community development director as well as state auditors. Um, this helps really improve our audit process with our state auditors, knowing that we're abiding by state statutes. Also improves the municipal audit process with finance, as well as competency in our TIF disbursement of funds. Service enhancement requests. Uh, certified main assessors need at least 16 hours of continuing education a year <laughs> to maintain certification. Currently, we have three CMAs in the office, two of them being here full-time and one myself being shared with Biddeford. There's also webinars, one, uh, webinars which might become more popular now, uh, one-day seminars, one-day assessor trainings. Um, these happen a lot and they're very beneficial. If we wanna really focus on succession planning, uh, we really need to take advantage of how, the importance of training. Travel, um, also the mileage to go to the educational facilities. Our computer assisted mass appraisal software vision. Uh, we also had some uh, software costs that are just uh, straight, straight line costs. We have a separate assessing software for personal property and we have uh, versus real estate. Um, our vision system has the capability to do the personal property. Um, so, we want to do a, a, con a conversion of all of our personal property accounts to our vision software. Um, this will, in the long run, decrease maintenance costs. 
um, make it a lot easier to just knowing that we have one software that can handle the capabilities of assessing the personal property along with the real estate. As, as Dick mentioned, um, telephone, um, we deal a lot with long distance calls, business owners that own um, equipment that are, uh, you know, out of state. Um, and, you know, so we, 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 we're, we're a department that really deals a lot with, with phone calls. And um, so based on that, you know, with def, we're asking for a little bit more in, in that department. So we look at some of our major challenges going forward. Um, what we've seen, and it's no secret, a lot of Southern Maine is seeing this, especially coastal properties, uh, market activity and appreciation. Last year, between July 1st, 2018 and June 30th, 2019, there were 558 total sales in SOCO. The reason why we know that is because the state, our auditors, they come every year and audit these sales. So the most recent audit that is going to be coming up shortly, uh, these are, we have to go through each one of these individual sales and and make sure that are these sales good qualified sales or are they not good qualified sales? As a result, 462 of those sales we put as qualified sales. What that means is that's an arm's length transaction, as they say, which really represents market value. So it's a good comparison of our assessed value to sales price. So we can come up with a ratio on that parcel. 343 of those sales are part of this residential study. And based on state statutes, this residential study is used to declare a certified ratio. Right now, our ratio is right around 80% for those properties. <clears throat> As a result, if we do not do any market adjustments per state statutes, we will only be able to declare a certified ratio for FY, 20, 20, FY 2022 that varies by 10% from that final number that the state auditors will come up with. They might not come up with exactly, but we know it's gonna be pretty close to that number. So that would mean that the highest ratio that we could, that SOCO could declare in FY22 would be 88%. So what does that all mean? Well, we get reimbursements from the state. Homestead, veterans, our per, uh, Betty, which is a personal property exemption we would only get up to 88% of those reimbursements that we get from the state. That's all the state would give us um, if these numbers hold true, which like I said, they're gonna be pretty close. And also we would have to factor our personal property assessment down by 88%. To be fair, we gotta be equitable uh, with the personal property and the real estate, so fair is fair, that would have to be factored also. State valuation and disbursement of revenue sharing is based on the market. So when when, the auditors come up with a state valuation number, it's the market. It's not, your assessments can be at 70, 75, 80, 90. State valuation is this is the market, regardless of where your ratios are. So the, an, an early analysis of current sales for the upcoming sales period, July 1, 19, the current, doesn't really show much of a difference from that 80%. So we really know where our market is right now. We know where Saco's market is. We know what the challenges we have ahead as far as this and how are we going to, you know, really go forward and figure out how we can, you know, what is the best interest for Saco? <clears throat> so right now we look at our mill rate. Well, our mill rate doesn't really represent 100% of value. Not, and nothing remotely close. So we know that our average is somewhere in the 80% range. So, you know, that just, it just tells you when we look at that rate that it doesn't represent anything close to 100% of value. And I put here on the bottom a few different um, numbers for state valuation history. So July 17 to July 18, that would be July 1st to June 30th. Um, the last state valuation that was done was 84%. The one prior to that was 89%, and the one prior to that was 91%. You can see the trend here that we're going. And also we did we did we did some moderate updates too. So Really, the market trend is a little bit higher than that if we wouldn't have done any updates. But it just shows where the market is going. And again, this is consistent with a lot of Southern Maine. This is what we're seeing. Um, you know, Saco is a growing community, and we've seen that. 
So this leads me to the revaluation service enhancement request. The last time SOCO had a revaluation done was in 2006. Anybody who has studied the market has seen that there has been a de decline in appreciation since 2006. A few other municipalities have either gone through a revaluation or are in the process. Specifically, Scarborough just went through one, went just finished uh, just finished one, and Portland is basically in the process of one. So there, you know, those are two other growing communities that are experiencing the same circumstances as Saco. So what's another route we can do? We can update properties just on sales to market, which has been done in recent years, and it will create equity in the residential properties. Because the residential, we, we basically take, okay, this is the assessed value, this is the sales price, this is our ratio. We come up with something that's fair and equitable as an average, as a mean. But, the, but Saco is very diverse. Saco's got all kinds of different types of commercial properties. And our data shows that we don't have a substantial amount of commercial sales or a commercial sale for every different type of use of property. So we can, we, we can make a consistent adjustment on the commercial properties, but we can't guarantee that that's gonna create equity across the board. And that's what we do. That's our obligation to the city. That's, that's what we try to do the best that we can. So we, we, we can create equity in some commercial properties that we have sales, but we can't guarantee it's gonna be across the board. So what does a revaluation do? Why, why would we need this to be done? Well, a revaluation utilizes all three approaches to value. We have the cost approach, we have the market approach, which is sales, and we have an income approach. And all the data, so this is basically collecting all the market data. And what we do, or what the reval company is gonna do is take all this data, decide what data is relevant, and they're going to take all these three approaches to value and they're going to correlate the three approaches to value. And we're going to check it and check it and check it to make sure that it's consistent. We're going to run ratio analysis after we're done. And we're going to make sure, okay, this is fair. This is fair. We've stratified different neighborhoods out. We know that this is fair. We feel comfortable. After we're done that process, uh, a huge important part is to give the taxpayer the opportunity to meet and discuss their new assessment. So that means a notice will be sent to every taxpayer. We're gonna give the opportunity to every taxpayer to say, okay, this is your new assessment. If you wanna have a discussion with us, come on in, we're gonna discuss everything. It, it will help if there's any inconsistencies in certain properties that we haven't looked at in a while, it certainly is going to help you know, with that process and say, okay, this is what we came up with, this is your property, we have three bedrooms, two baths, 1,200 square feet, it's a cape. You know, does, does this make sense? You know, we can't, you know, the homeowner doesn't can say no assessor. I don't want you to come into our property, but you know, we're going to give them the opportunity and, and we should, especially when we're doing something uh, along these lines. So I understand that this is a big service enhancement and undertaking. Um, you know, I could easily say, no, we don't need to do this. Um, but as the assessor, you know, it's important to create equity across the board, especially since this hasn't been done in basically a decade and a half. Um, so we feel it's absolutely necessary for SACO. And we know that when we're done this process, it will create absolute consistency in assessments. It, it will, it'll establish a mill rate that is represented more to market. Um, and also we're gonna get all the reimbursements from the state, all the reimbursements that, that they give us. Uh, one thing to know is, you know, everybody's homestead, let's say, next, you know, whatever that max amount is, this year is gonna be 25. We can't give full, full exemption to every taxpayer. And I use a homestead because that's, a, you know, the, the most popular exemption because the state's not gonna reimburse us that percent that they reimburse us, which this year is gonna be 70%. 70, 70%. We just, we, based on their statutes, we're not where we need to be with our ratios for them to give us full reimbursement. So. Um, you know, these are, this is the reason why we're requesting this. We think it's the best decision for SACO. Um, ultimately what it's going to do is it's going to create a good foundation of assessments with all of our properties across, uh, the city. We're going to keep and hold that data. It's going to be data that we're going to have, and we can always build upon that data in the future. If we do any type of adjustments, whether it's up or down, depending on how the, how the market goes, but it's, it's, it's a big service enhancement agreement, uh, service enhancement request in the short, and you know, 
for this year, but ultimately it's going to be a beneficial to SOCO in the long run with their equitability in assessments. Um, so I'll leave it at that and I'll take any questions you guys have. Nick, thank you. Is, is that the conclusion of your presentation? Yes. Okay. Counselors, do we have any questions for uh, tax assessor discharges? Any, any questions? Any comments? Uh, Nick, my only question is, uh, given that uh, we're in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 uh, debacle and, and, and um, you know, what's on the other side we're unsure of. Uh, and because of that, do you think that this is the right year uh, to go ahead with something that has uh, that kind of outreach needed in order to get uh, good, confident numbers uh, to really establish, um, you know, whatever the numbers come out as. But uh, I know that you you kind of explained that this is a big undertaking. Uh, and, and would it be wise to wait a, a year to see where uh, where, they're, where we are after COVID-19? Uh, and that might just be a personal preference question rather than a, a technical question because nobody can really answer where we're going to be right. post COVID-19. But uh, it's a question I'm, I, I defer to you and your judgment. Yeah, you know, and, and that's one thing I didn't mention um, throughout this presentation. Um, and this was all done, a lot of this, this was done as other, as other directors have said, prior to what we're dealing with now. Um, you know, what, if, if we do go along with this revaluation, let's, let, let's say for next year and have it effective for FY22, um, I think we'll be able to see where the market goes. Um, a lot of it does depend on how long we are in the shutdown mode. Um, so it's, we, we might, it might take, you know, a few months uh, to see, maybe four or five months to actually see how this is affected by the market. Um, so it's a great, the, a great question, Mayor. And, um, you know, you, you look at the people and what their thinking is when they, when they're looking at the market, some, some, some people, um, buyers, potential buyers might, um, you know, just, not sell their property therefore there's less sales so you might see less sales um you know so it's the indication would be if we really start seeing sales um you know our ratios go up let's say all of a sudden a sale comes in and now we're looking at 90 95 percent it's and it's consistent um so the the early indications of buyers and sellers would be okay well i don't want to uh, sell my property. I don't want to, uh, I'm not looking to buy because I want to see what the outcome is economically with this uh, pandemic that we're dealing with. So you might have a stretch of a few months where not much sales activity going on. And then all of a sudden you'll see, okay, what are the remnants based on what we were dealing with as a pandemic? And where are those ratios? Are they higher than, are they 90, 95%? We might not see that till maybe late summer, early fall, depending on how long the shutdown goes. Um, but if we do see that and we do go along with the revaluation, it's our job to, tr to trend um, if we need to trend. Um, we, you know, so we, you know, that's very important. Um, you know, we can always go to 95%. We don't have to go to 100% of market. We can always give ourselves a little bit of a buffer. Um, so, um, but that's, those are discussions that we can have um, to see if, if it's worth, you know, putting it off or, um, but it's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Copeland, you have your hand up. You have a question? I do. Um, thank you for your presentation. Have you put this out to bid at $450,000? I did. And, um, this point is just kind of preliminary, just kind of what, what I had, um, vision do which is like i contacted them because we have their software and i wanted to contact them first and um but as far as getting into you know exactly what they're going to do and, and getting another bit i haven't gotten there yet i just wanted to be able to get a rough number of what we're looking at for a understood evaluation how long does the process take to do it so if we're 
looking at a, a you know the COVID-19 thing and so let's think about if we should put this off to next year how long will the process of reassessing take <clears throat> It's, if, if you want to really do uh, good quality work, um, you really want to start the process earlier, probably after um, tax commitment, um, right? You really want to get the reval company to get on board, get all the sales, get all, collect all the, all the market data. So, you know, without having in-depth discussions with the reval company, if we were to implement one in FY 2022, we probably would want to get started uh, maybe late spring, early summer when we're about to commit our assessments um, and really get the ball rolling. Um, so if we're, if we're going to have discussions about putting this off for another year, um, we really need to possibly, um, you know, talk about, you know, putting it off and then making a decision. So because we want to really, we, re, we really want to contact them soon so that we can get the ball rolling on what's going to happen. Get a strategic plan. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Councillor Copeland. Uh, any other questions for the tax assessor? Uh, seeing no other questions or no other comments, Nick, thank you very much uh, and have a great evening and be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. With that, we have completed the uh, department budget presentations for the evening. So now we will move on to uh, item number 11, which is the administrative update. Uh, City Administrator Kainra. Uh Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, beginning with uh, the senior programs and assistance. Uh, as many of you know, this past Friday, the city held its second senior meals program. It was, again, a great success. We had approximately 150 meals served um, via pickup and delivery. Um, thank you again to all of our volunteers uh, and city staff who worked hard to put this event on, um, and to all of you uh, for your support also. Uh, this coming week, we'll have our, our third um, edition, uh, April, Friday, April 17th, from 11 to 1230 at the Community Center. Uh, this week, we'll be partnering with uh, Kiro Cafe for the meal, so thank you to them for participating um, in this program. Also, uh, Amelia Meyer and Mary Starr, who you know are heading up our senior assistance uh, efforts, are currently drafting a newsletter to put out to seniors um, with uh, more information and resources available to them um, from the city, including uh, requesting an absentee ballot, uh, what to do about your vehicle registrations, and also emphasizing that all city facilities um, are currently closed with the exception of the transfer station. But obviously this population, not all of them are uh, online all the time. So it's important to reach them through other, uh, other means and that means uh, direct mail. So we're working on putting out a direct mail piece uh, to them. We might end up doing a follow-up one uh, after that. Um, the working group on senior programs also continues to meet at 5 p.m. on Tuesdays um, involving age-friendly SACO and uh, some other outside agencies. And we continue to try to collaborate as best we can with all of those groups. Uh, in order to meet the needs of our seniors uh, in the community. So thank you to everyone for your efforts um, in all of these programs. I think we're doing a great job and I think the, uh, the seniors in our community are very appreciative and thankful for all the work we're doing. So thank you to everyone for, for a great job there. Uh, as I mentioned last week, the city has rolled out a COVID uh, hotline. I'd like to once again, just promote and plug that. Uh, we are receiving calls on it. Um, and I think, again, the, the public is appreciative of us, of us setting up this hotline. So, again, that number is 207-294-2436. Um, please call with any questions, uh, comments, or needs of assistance, and we will direct you to the right, uh, the right people to help you out. Um, also, uh, as uh, Emily noted earlier, we continue to update the website uh, with all the most recent uh, COVID updates and resources that are important for our community members uh, to be aware of. Uh, another issue we've gotten some, um, some feedback on is uh, beach traffic and visitation at other recreational spots around the city. Um, we are continuing to closely monitor the amount of uh, people on the beach, the crowds, uh, you know, or so-called crowds that are gathering. Um, as, as of right now, it hasn't uh, reached the threshold of being a major problem, but as the weather gets warmer, we do anticipate this could be a problem and we continue to monitor it closely. Our police department is continuing to monitor and patrol these areas closely. Uh, I will say uh, this past weekend, we um, put one of our electronic message boards 
uh, down near the corner of Ferry and Seaside to again inform people of the governor's executive order that's in place, which involves quarantining for 14 days if you're from out of state. And uh, as you know, we are prepared to take further action um, should there be increased visitation that presents a public health hazard at our, our trails, beaches, and other public places uh, of recreation. So we will continue to monitor that closely and we're taking it very seriously. Uh, some personnel updates I wanted to make you aware of. First of all, um, our administrative assistant, Lori Angus in the uh, police department has announced her retirement from the city after 26 years of service. Uh, I wanna thank Lori uh, very much for her dedication, years of service to the city. 26 years is quite a lengthy career with us. So thank you very much to Lori. We wish her well in her years of retirement. And uh, once social distancing is no longer in place, we will have a larger celebration to recognize Lori uh, for her service to the city. So thank you very much to Lori. Uh, the other uh, update I wanted to give you under personnel is um, the finance department will be welcoming Kim Kennedy as our new fire uh, um, finance and payroll um, manager. She'll be taking on the payroll capacity as I updated you on uh, earlier. So uh, Kim comes to us with many years of experience in payroll and finance. Um, she should be a great addition to our team and we're hoping to make her transition as smooth as possible. Uh, obviously with the, the strange conditions we're working under and uh, we find ourselves in operationally. So welcome Kim and we hope to make her onboarding uh, the best experience possible considering. So we're excited to have her. I'm uh, excited to con continue to grow and improve uh, our payroll process. Uh, thank you very much. That's all I have. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brian. Councilor Copeland, you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, certainly appreciate you getting that sign down there, but I'm wondering if there could be more signs. Uh, you know, this is vacation land and we're going to get a lot of people from a lot of different places. Uh, I'm wondering if we could put a sign like, that area where uh, exit 2A is off of 195 so the people coming in from out of state can see it right there and also if we can get one down um, by where you if you take temple all the way down turn right at the end and you go over that little bridge right there when it when you enter Saco so, so Kelso, the, the one issue is we only have two of these signs. Uh, one has to be used at the transfer station because we've reopened that. We need one there. So we have moved the one down to uh, down to near the beach. That that sign was off of 195, informing visitors uh, there. But we thought it was more important, you know, since some of the concerns we've gotten to move it down by the beach. So the problem we run into there is we only have two of these signs. Well, I wonder if the uh, federal funding for different things that community needs in this pandemic, if this, if a couple of more of those signs, I don't know how much they cost, uh, could be funded through that money. We could look into purchasing more and, and get some costs. We could certainly get some more information. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Councilor McPhail? Yeah, to expand on Brian's point um, with last week's senior meal, I personally would like to give a huge shout out um, to Amelia, Erica, and Ryan at the Park and Rec. Um, they've done an amazing job at organizing this and getting the flow going. Um, I know our seniors are so appreciative. Um, also, our state senator, Justin Chenette, state rep Donna Bailey, um, Rob and Ripley Biggs from Saco Main Street, Brian himself has been there as well, and Don Roth. Um, Golden Rooster has done it the last two weeks, and this week we have Quero, as he stated. And this is actually sponsored by Saco Bitterford Savings. Um, huge asset to our community. They always step up and help us out. So just a personal shout out to everybody that's volunteered and has been involved. Thank you very much. Any other questions uh, for Brian? Seeing no questions, moving on to uh, item 12, council discussion and comment. Are there any council discussion and comment? Seeing no hands raised, no council discussion and comment. Moving on to item 13, executive session. Is there a motion to enter executive session? There is, Mayor. Be it Councilor ordered. Minthorn. Be it ordered that the City Council enter into executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Chapter 13, Subchapter 1, Section 4056C, CEA discussion. 
Is there a second to that motion? Second. Motion's been made by Councilor Minthorn, second by Councilor Gunn. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing no discussion, roll call vote. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Copeland? Yes. Councilor Minthorn? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. And Councilor Johnston? Yes. A motion passes 7 0 to enter executive session at 8 30. Remember, folks, uh, after we get back from executive session, we'll be coming back to this feed. Uh, and, and now you're going to go to the executive session. Um, uh, three minute recess? There will be a three minute, five minute recess. Thank you. So we should leave this meeting. Leave this meeting and go to the uh, link that uh, City Administrator Canrath sent you. Uh, earlier you. today. Thank you very much. Yeah.
<laughs> Welcome back, everyone. We're just waiting on uh, Councillor Purdy, then we'll uh, look to get a motion. Here he Councilor is. Purdy is there. Uh, all councillors are present. Is there a motion to a, uh, exit executive session? Yes, Mayor, there is. Be it ordered the City Council exit executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Chapter 13, Subchapter 1, Section 4056C, CEA discussion. Motion's been made by Councilor Minthorn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Copeland. Any discussion? Uh, seeing no hands raised, roll call vote. Councilor Archer? Aye. Councilor Purdy? Yes. Councilor Gunn? Yes. Councilor Copeland? Yes. Councilor Minthorn? Yes. Councilor McPhail? Yes. And Councilor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. We're out of executive session at 9 07. Uh, Councilor Minthorn, any report from executive session? There is no report, Mr. Mayor. No report, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded and moved by Councillor Minthorn, second by Councillor Copeland. Uh, any discussion? Seeing no discussion, ro roll call vote. Councillor Archer? Aye. Councillor Purdy? Yes. Councillor Gunn? Yes. Councillor Copeland? Yes. Councillor Minthorn? Yes. Councillor McPhail? Yes. And Councillor Johnston? Yes. Motion passes 7 0. We are adjourned at 9 07. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your, uh, everything tonight. You all did a great job. Good night. Good night. Have good a night. good night. Be safe.